Let's open our Bibles, if you will, to Matthew 28, and I want to finish this message that we started last week about discipleship. Uh, Jesus makes these statements right before he ascends into heaven, and it says this. Verse 17 of Matthew 28, it says, And when they saw him, they worshipped him, and some were still doubtful. And Jesus came up, and he spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And there's the will of Christ for every single believer's life. But he gives us this commission, I want you to go and make disciples. What we saw last week, disciples are made. This doesn't happen just by accident, they are made. And then we talked about what was necessary. Well, we said we, we had to be encouraging one another. The Bible says don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We need to be surrounded. We need to be connected in community with other believers so that they can pray for us, encourage us, teach us. We can worship together, serve together. We need that. And then we talked about prayer and how essential prayer is. Now, I would just remind you as you go through this, look how Jesus says this. He said, you go and make the disciples, you lead people to accept me. And then he puts it in this order. He says, you baptize them, and then you teach them. You know, I had the privilege of talking to a mother right before the service. She's a great mom and a great lady, and she was telling me about her family. And, and uh, we talked about one of her children, and uh, so she said he'd accepted Christ. And uh, we were wanting to wait a while, and... Uh, Make sure he understands. Well, I'm all about that. I want to make sure a child or an adult understands. But one thing I said to her, I said, some people get the uh, notion in their mind, even as adults, are teenagers. Well, what I need to do, I've accepted Jesus, so I need, to, I need to study a long time, and I need to read a lot in the Bible before I'm baptized. Well, that's not what the Bible says. I'm reminded of Pentecost, after the message was given, there were 3,000 people that were saved, they were baptized. They didn't go through a six-week training course or ten weeks. You have to study so much of uh, Old Testament Scripture, you have to do it. No, they had given their lives to Jesus, they were baptized. I think of the Ethiopian eunuch, and here he is, he'd been in a place of worship. This is a man who was the head of finance of all Ethiopia. And this man's riding on the Gaza Strip, and the Lord takes Philip, and he moves upon Philip's life, tells him to go to the Gaza Strip. And when this man comes by, he's reading from the book of Isaiah. And Philip hears him, and he's prompted by the Lord to go up to him, and he just goes and asks him a question, do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian eunuch, the man who was brilliant in finances, he said, well, how can I unless someone explains it to me? So Philip gets up in that chair and begins to talk to him about Jesus, and the man accepts Jesus. And then the man's question to Philip, he said, what's to prevent me from being baptized? And uh, there was water. They were close to water, and Philip said, well, nothing. If you believe in Jesus, and they baptized him right then. And I just remind all of us, when a person accepts Christ, if you've made that decision, uh, Christ tells us right here, you need to be baptized. It's a public demonstration of your allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. I accepted Jesus when I was seven. That was in a morning service. I was baptized that night. And someone said, well, you really didn't know what you were doing. Well, I certainly did. Jesus Christ came into my life. And that baptism was meaningful and special to me. And Jesus says, you baptize them, then you teach them. He doesn't say... Make disciples, lead them to me, then you teach them all that I've commanded you, and after you teach them all I've commanded you, then you baptize them. He said, no, once they've accepted, then you baptize, then you teach. And so that's a part of the discipling process. So here there's that public allegiance that you make through baptism, public declaration, and then there is the importance of being together with other believers, and then prayer. And I want to talk about these things this morning, the rest of this. And uh, it's this. One, you have to absorb the Word of God. If you're going to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ and grow in this in-depth relationship with Jesus, you must absorb the Word of God. Now, notice I didn't just say read it. Read it's a part of it. But you want to read it. You want to meditate on it. You want to memorize it. And you want to utilize it. 
Uh, it's not the teaching of the Word where the Lord just tells us, I just read it. A lot of people read it. I mean, you can read it and then just go your merry way and live life like you want to. Madeline Murray O'Hare was the renowned atheist. She's been dead for a number of years. And I can assure you, if she could come back and speak right now, she would encourage you to give your life to Christ if you haven't. But this lady was this avowed atheist, but she'd read the entire Bible. She had read the entire Bible. So just reading it, that's not it. You make it a part of your life through meditating on it, memorizing it, and then you utilize it. You practice what it has to say. Now, why is that so crucial if you're going to be a disciple? Well, look what the Word of God does. Look over in Psalm 19. These are some great verses. It just reminds us of what God's Word, what it accomplishes in our lives. Psalm 19 and verse 7, it says this. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. You know, our souls at times, we can be wounded. Our souls can be torn apart. We can be broken. How in the world is the soul put back together? I mean, that can happen for a follower of Jesus. Well, they're just broken in their life. How's that soul mended? You know, the 23rd Psalm says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. And then it says this, he restores my soul. Wonderful. How does he do that? How does he do that? Well, it tells you right here in this verse we're looking at. Through his word. When a person takes the word of God and they take it into their life, they read it. God uses his word to minister to them to bring healing to their soul. Comfort, strength, peace comes through reading the word of God and having it in your heart. Here's something else. It makes us wise. Look in verse 7. It says, The testimony of the Lord is sure, it's certain, making wise the simple. I made reference to wisdom last week. You get wisdom from God through prayer, certainly, and through reading the Word of God, through studying it. You know, the Bible says in the book of James, it says there's a wisdom from above and there's a wisdom from below. And the wisdom from above, that's from God, and it's pure, it's peaceable, it's good. But the wisdom from below, the wisdom of the earth, is devilish. It's sinful. And you want the wisdom from above. How can you have this? I mean, we live in this world where it's quite challenging now in these times in which we live. It says in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20, here's what was going on in Isaiah's day. Isaiah makes this comment. He said, you've reached the place as a society of people where that which is evil you call good and that which is good you call evil. Well, let me tell you, we're right there. That's where we are as a society. Things that God says are wrong, absolutely wrong before him, we're saying these things are all right. This is wonderful. And things that are good, uh, people say negative things about that and say that's bad. So here you are in this world with all that's coming at you in the culture. How in the world do you have this discerning spirit so that you can know what God says is good? Forget about what the world says. What does God say is good? And how do you follow that way? You get that wisdom through the Word of God. And then it does this. It rejoices the heart. Look at the comment that's made in verse 8. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Listen, you think on things that are trustworthy, that are true, which the Bible admonishes us to do, that does rejoice your heart. You think on things that are negative and that are filthy, and you may get a little kick out of that and a pleasure out of that for a while, but that dirties up your life, your mind, your spirit. And there's no joy in that in the long run. But when you dwell on what the Word of God says, it rejoices. It brings joy to the heart. And then it does this. It enlightens one spiritually. Look in verse 8, the last part of it. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. And it's talking about your spiritual eyes. How will you know about God? How will you know what the Lord is like, what He feels about certain things, certain practices, certain lifestyles. How would you know how he feels about people? How will you know how he feels about you if you don't look at the Word of God? You won't. All you'll do is just make conjectures, and a lot of times you're going to be absolutely wrong in what he thinks about you. 
Some people are at a point where they think because of things I've done, God must hate me. He must hate me. Maybe you're at that point in your own life. Or maybe you're going through some hard time mentally or physically or financially. And you think in your life, you know, he must not like me. He must be extremely upset with me because these things are happening in my life. Maybe he's lost his love for me. And yet the Bible tells us you can't do one single thing that will cause God to lose his love for you. And if you don't read the Bible, though, you're not going to know that. So it helps us to understand about God. It helps us to understand about mankind and the behavior of man and some of the things that human beings can do to one another. The Word of God gives truth about that. It helps you to make sense about what's happening in the world. It does that. You know, a lot of people look at the world, they can become so distressed and so burdened when they see things that are going on and the atrocities that are committed. Listen, I heard on the radio this week, you know, there's a part it's a, in the Middle East where they are taking organs, not from little, little babies, but from children and teenagers and adults. And they were playing just a recording of this. And they're not giving anesthesia to these people. I mean, it's unbelievable. You wouldn't do that to an animal. And things that people are doing like that, and you think the world is just so corrupt. Listen, how do you, you can just be scared to death. And yet when I look at things like that, I'm reminded of what Jesus says over here in Matthew chapter 24. And a part of this, even though it grieves me that things and tragedies happen in the world, to see the condition of mankind just reminds me, based on the word of Christ, we're closer and closer to the return of Jesus to this earth. Because look what it says here in Matthew 24. Jesus is talking about the end of the age, and there are a lot of people that look at verse 6, and they make a big issue out of this and say, well, we're hearing of wars and rumors of wars, and so this is a sign that we're right at the end. Well, Jesus says in that verse, see that you're not frightened, these things must take place, but that's not yet the end. He said, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. In various places, there are going to be famines and earthquakes. He says, these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. That's not the sign that the end is imminent. But then he goes on and talks about what is. He says to the believer, verse 9, they're going to deliver you up to tribulation. They'll kill you. You'll be hated of all nations for, because of my name. At that time, here's what's going to happen, a callousness in the world. Many will fall away. Many will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and mislead many. Lawlessness is increased. Most people's love will grow cold. Jesus said the one who endures to the end will be saved. He said the gospel is going to be preached in all the world. Then the end will come. You know, when I look at that, I'm seeing here this, this cold, callous spirit that exists within the world, the persecution against believers in the world. To me, that's one of the strongest signs about the return of Christ. And I'll tell you, the other thing to me is Israel. Israel. And people put off Israel. There have been past, a past administration that undermined, sought to undermine Israel. You better stand with Israel. You know, you can read in the Old Testament about all these, the Canaanites, the Midianites, all these ites. You don't read of them anymore, you don't hear of them anymore, but you do hear this, the Israelites. They're still here, and God in prophetic words said, Israel will go back to their homeland. 1948, he's taken them back. And they're still there, hated, but there they are. And to me, that's a sign. God is bringing us now closer and closer to this end time. But you don't know those things. You're not enlightened to that if you're not reading and studying the Word of God. It does this, enlightens us. And then it does this. With the Word of God, look at what it says here in verse 13. It says, this is how you resist temptation. It says, and keep your servant from pre presumptuous sins. And how does that happen again with the Word of God? Jesus resisted temptation by quoting Scripture. That's exactly how I did it. If that's how he does it, that's how you and I need to do it. And then there's this, the word of God conditions my heart and my words to be pleasing to the Lord. Look in verse 14. 
Well, the psalmist closes this out. He said, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The only way that happens is if your life is absorbed with God's word. The psalmist made the statement in another passage where he says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. That is the only way that you can really stay away from sin and that your words will be what they should be, that they would be uplifting and not burdensome, that they would strengthen people and not cut them down, and that your lifestyle, the way that you live, it's when the Word of God is in your life and you're dwelling on the Word and living by the Word of God. So that's what, if you're going to be a disciple of Christ, you must take the Word of God into your life. That's why it's imperative for all of us. Every single day, you need to read the Word of God. You need to reflect on it. You don't need to speed read it. You speed read other books, but don't speed read the Word of God. You read it, pray over it, meditate on it, memorize do you do that do you practice memorization I'll take some verses and memorize these verses and then you utilize it that is essential for any person to be a true disciple of Christ and then there is this you need to be honest with the Lord you know I wish I could say every single day every day you walk with Jesus gonna be a sweet wonderful day well I thank the Lord Jesus for every single day but every day is not just a fantastic day because there are days when there are going to be hurts and there's going to be things that occur that grieve you, that sadden you. I mean, that is just part of living. There can be people that rise up against you, be negative against you. There can be, you know, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians about believers who were carnal. Carnal believers can even attack you because of your walk with Christ. They can. Or they can walk away from you. Just like Demas walked away from the Apostle Paul because he loved the world. And so those things can happen and you can be saddened in your life. But here's the, here's the best thing you can do. You need to be honest with the Lord about what you're thinking, what you're feeling. There are times when you and I can sin, even when we have the heart to be close to the Lord, where we sin. And we can be so grief-stricken over that. You know, I want to use one guy in the Bible as an example. And then I want to use the other disciples also in an illustration. And the one I want to use, Simon Peter. And Simon Peter, when you read through the gospel, I love Simon Peter. And Simon Peter, I picture him to be a big, strong man. And he was an intense man. And uh, Simon Peter was very forceful. He was not shy, that's for certain. And Simon Peter, one time in, my, in Matthew 14, it says he's in the boat with the disciples and a storm is out there. And here comes Jesus walking on the water. Now, no other disciple saying this, but Simon Peter says... Well, Lord, if that's you, bid me to come unto thee. You just tell me to come and I'll walk out there on the water. Jesus said, will you come right on? Simon Peter gets out of that boat. He starts walking on the water. He has his eyes on Christ and Jesus is giving him the ability. But the Bible says in that scripture that Simon Peter all of a sudden started looking at the waves, looking at the trouble and the storm. When he took his eyes off Jesus, he began to sink. And then he cried, oh, Lord, Lord, save me. And Jesus did, lifted him up, put him in the boat. And you'd think, well, man, Simon, you messed up there. I mean, you, you look real good there at first, and then you just kind of fell on your face. You took your eyes off Jesus. A little bit later in Matthew chapter 16, there at Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus has the disciples, who do people say that I am? And they give him the answer of what people are saying. And then he says this, whom do you say that I am? Simon Peter, again, he doesn't have to think about it. He doesn't have to talk to the other disciples. He just goes, well, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus goes, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood is not revealed this unto thee, but my Father who is in heaven. That's a, that's a high water mark there for Peter. Wonderful Peter. Great testimony right after that. Jesus gets these disciples and he said, we're fixing to go to Jerusalem. And when we get there, they're going to beat me. They're going to crucify me. And then I'll rise again. Well, apparently Peter didn't think much about the rising again part. He just heard beat and crucify. And Simon Peter got right in the face of Jesus and rebuked him. He said, Lord, may it never be. That should no, that should never happen. And Jesus looked at him and said, 
Get thee behind me, Satan. Simon Peter in that moment is under the influence of Satan. And you would think that Jesus would just go, can't use this guy. I mean, he's too wishy-washy. Great testimony one moment, and then rebukes me the next. I'll have to find somebody else, but Jesus didn't. A little bit later after that, right before the crucifixion, Jesus with Simon Peter, he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has sought permission to sift you like wheat. But he said, I want you to know, I've prayed for you. And when you turn back, then you strengthen the brothers. And Peter goes, I will never turn away from you. I will never deny you. If I have to die, I will die for you. Jesus said, Simon, before the rooster crows, you will deny that you even know me three times. Simon Peter said, that's not going to happen, but it did. Three different occasions, he denied he knew the Lord. And the rooster crowed, and Jesus, they were in close proximity, and Jesus turned and looked at him. And the Bible says Simon Peter was broken. And he wept so sad, the grievous sin. He denied the Lord. Now again, you would think, and Jesus would just say, well, that's, that's it for him. I mean, I've given him plenty of opportunity, plenty of chances. And he just can't cut the mustard. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus prayed for him. And by the way, it was this man, Simon Peter, that at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came, that the Lord used him to preach. And 3,000 were saved. And I'm saying all those blunders and the shortcomings of Peter in the discipleship process, Jesus just used that to develop him. He does the same thing for you if you have a heart for him. Peter did have a heart for him. But he'll do that same thing. And then I think one other illustration, just the disciples as a whole, when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, with Peter, James, and John up there, there was a man that had his son. His son was demon-possessed. He was in convulsions. And it was horrible. And he brings his son to the disciples. And Jesus had given the disciples the authority to cast out demons. But they couldn't. They couldn't do it. Well, when Jesus comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration, there's a great commotion. And Jesus asks, well, what's going on here? And the father speaks up said, well, I brought my boy. And my, my boy's gone through this affliction. And I told your disciples, but they couldn't do anything. And the first words out of Jesus' mouth is, a wicked and perverse generation, how long shall I put up with you? Now, he's talking to his disciples. And you'd think when he uses that kind of terminology, this is it. Jesus is saying, forget it. Jesus said, bring the boy to me. Jesus brought healing to the boy. And then after that, to the credit of the disciples, instead of them shrinking into a shell and saying, he, don't want, he doesn't want to have anything else to do with us, he said, we're wicked and perverse generation, and we've let him down, and he's just going to discard it. They didn't do that. They went to him, and they were just honest. They asked him, Lord, why couldn't we cast this out? And Jesus didn't go, get away from me. I mean, you've been with me all this time. I've empowered you. And now you've failed me here. Just leave me alone. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus answered their question. He said, this kind comes out only by prayer. And he didn't get rid of the disciples. This was a growing time. But they were honest with him. Now look, I'm saying to you in your life, there are going to be things that come up in life. That you're going to be disappointed in yourself. And maybe some of you are at a point like that right now. And you think because of something I've done. Maybe in the past week or the past year or the past month. He can't do anything with me. Yes he can. You go to him and be honest with him. Or maybe you have questions. Some questions. And you think because I have questions. That he can't use me. That's not true. Listen I have questions in my own life. The other evening I was reading the Baptist Messenger. And I'd heard about this. I'd heard about the uh, youth minister's wife over at Jinx. I think it was First Baptist Jinx. And this young lady, I think she was about eight months pregnant, and she had gone to see her mother 
and collapsed. She never regained consciousness. She died. And the little baby, they got the little baby, took the baby out, and the baby had life for a little bit, but then the baby died. When I'd heard this story, but when I'm reading the Baptist Messenger, they had her picture and her husband's picture. And here's this handsome young man, and she's a beautiful young lady. And I'm laying on my bed, reading. And my wife walks in, and I just said to, to Linda, when I read this, after I saw her picture, I said, I don't understand this. I have no idea why would this beautiful young lady who'd given her life to Christ was in ministry with her husband, have this little baby right on the threshold of life. Why'd she have to die? Why'd that baby have to die? And I need to tell my wife, I told the Lord, I've said that to the Lord. You'd think, well, you shouldn't talk like that to the Lord. Oh, yes, I should. I'm not questioning the Lord. I'm just saying I don't understand. And in times like that, when I've said things like that to the Lord and talked to him, just expressed what was on my heart, believe me, that helps me. It helps me as time goes by. My faith and my trust in him, I know he knows what's best. I know that. But the more honest I am with him, if I make blunders and I make plenty of them, if I commit sin and I do that, if I just go and be honest with him, that helps tremendously. If you're going to be a disciple of Jesus, you don't need to try to hide things from him. And the final thing I'd mention for a disciple is just this. Uh, you've got to be a witness for the Lord Jesus. Here in this passage when he says you go and make disciples, he's saying that to all believers. You know, this week, the great Billy Graham went to heaven. And Billy Graham, he's, uh, I've never met him personally. I've stood right beside him and never, never met him and got to talk with him. But just watching him on television, hearing him preach in person, it's had a major impact on my life. When 99 years old, a great man, he preached face-to-face -to, -face to over 200 million people and to millions more on television and radio. And some people look at some, a person like Billy Graham and say, now that's who this is about. This great commission, go and make disciples. All you missionaries, all you evangelists, people like Billy Graham, this is what God's saying to you. You are short-sighted spiritually if, you, if that's how you read that. Because he's not saying that to somebody just like Billy Graham. He's saying that to you. If you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is exactly what he expects of you. You go. You make disciples. You tell people about Jesus. And you know, I just ask you do, you, do you do that? When is the last time that you have personally shared with another person about Jesus Christ and what he's done for you and how they need him in their life? And some of you may say, well, you know what? I've told my children and my grandchildren, wonderful. You should. That is wonderful. But I want to ask you this. When's the last time you've talked to somebody outside of your family and shared with them about Jesus? You know, that's what a disciple is. You know, think about churches. People ask, you know, can, can Meadowood grow? Can other churches grow? Yes. But they're not going to grow through programs. They're not going to grow through programs. They're not going to grow because of just some worship we do in here. If nobody's telling the outside public, they don't have a clue what's going on in here. The only way any church can grow is for the believers in that church to be true disciples for the Lord Jesus. To be together worshiping, studying, sharing, ministering, caring for each other, yes. But they've got to go outside the walls of the church. And they have got to be communicating the gospel to people around them and inviting them to Jesus. And inviting them to church. Any church that has believers that are true disciples that will do that, that church can grow. But I'll tell you this. Any church that doesn't do that... They can meet together and they may have a great big crowd now. But you let the years go by. And the people that are not true disciples. Well, that church will just wither away and die. 
There have been famous churches in this country that used to have scores of people in them that they have no one now. That doesn't have to happen if people will just follow what Jesus is saying here. He said, you go and make disciples. You do this. My power is given unto you. You do this. And I'll bless your ministry and people can come to know Christ. People's lives can be changed. Families can be put back together. But we've got to obey Christ in that. You know, I would just close by asking you, are you in your own life a really a genuine disciple of the Lord Jesus? I love this old hymn, and I'll finish with this. It's called Footsteps of Jesus, and it just says this. Sweetly, Lord, have we heard thee calling. Come, follow me. And we see where thy footprints falling lead us to thee. Though they lead o'er the cold, dark mountains seeking his sheep, are along by Siloam's fountains, helping the weak. If they lead through the temple holy, preaching the word, are in homes of the poor and lowly, serving the Lord. Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus wherever they go. Would you make that kind of commitment to Christ? Whatever you want me to do, I want to be your servant. I want to be your disciple. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this moment. I know you're in this place. And I think you're working right now. Lord, I do pray for any person in who has never given their life to you. I pray that you'd minister to them, help them to realize their need of you. Lord, I pray for people who have accepted you've never been baptized. I pray they would not hold out on that any longer. Help them to know that's the first step of publicly following you. But Lord, I pray for all of us who are believers. Lord Jesus, we wouldn't be part-time believers. That we wouldn't just come in here on a Sunday and then do our own thing the rest of the week. Jesus, you've taught us what discipleship is. Help us to be true disciples for you. And Lord, I ask this in your name. While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, we'll be dismissed in just a moment. But this is a time of decision. And maybe a decision for you privately, just right where you are, to say, Jesus, I have not been what I need to be. Maybe I am just a temporary follower. I don't want to be that way anymore. I don't care if I'm a plumber. I don't care if I'm retired, if I'm a teacher, if I'm a businessman or woman. If I'm a student. Jesus, I want to be your disciple. Maybe that's a commitment you need to make. However God deals in your life and works in your heart. Maybe you're looking for a church home, a place where you can be involved. And you feel like this is where the Lord wants you to be. If there's a decision public you need to make to accept him or to place your life here, as soon as we sing this song, I'll be right here at the front, and we'd welcome you to come forward. We'd love to talk with you about a decision that you need to make for Christ.